welcome again, everyone. Uh, I've just taken half an hour break, uh, and we're here to undertake the humble task of uh, debunking misinformation um, and uh, misconception about evolution uh, once and for all. I'm not sure we're going to do that today, but we're going to try to. Uh, I'd like you to please um, join me in welcoming uh, Aaron Ra and Dave Farina. How are you guys? Pretty good. Yep, doing well. Fantastic. Uh, well, we're going to get straight into it because um, uh, folks have been waiting for this for quite some time. Um, and we said we're going to tackle it from the Zachar Nike level um, uh, in evolution, which is the, the one. Uh, he's a medical doctor, apparently. And uh, th I think this, is ha this one has to be blatant because if you're related to science in any way or form, uh, you would know. Uh, the basic um, understanding of the difference between a scientific theory and a scientific hypothesis or a hypothesis. Um, and he's using the crowd's ignorance to appeal to the commonsensical, uh, colloquial meaning of the word theory. And mm -hmm. I'd like to start with with Aaron and, and, and see what you think about this one. Well, since you mentioned Zakir Naik, I wanted to throw out there... Uh, a little brag that when I was in India, there was a group that was trying to get a debate between me and him. And, and of course he wouldn't do that because he doesn't, he doesn't apparently do debates. Uh, he only addresses audiences where he has the one, you know, the control, the complete control of the information. And the very first quote that I had that I ever heard from him, which I cited in one of my videos, it, what you just brought up, where he says, there is no book I've come across that says fact of evolution. All the books I've come across said theory of evolution. So here's somebody who's deliberately misunderstanding theory. And the funny thing is, is it's not just that a scientific theory has a different definition than the common colloquial understanding. If you Google what a theory is, just simply Google it, you're going to see that it's not just a wild guess that may or may not be true. That it's, it's a bit more profound than that. But uh, even in the in the colloquial perspective, but from a scientific perspective, a theory is not, in any sense, a, a guess uh, or or a, a even a hypothesis. In one way, and I know that this is not the way that people teach it, but in one way that we could understand this is that when you have a hypothesis, uh, and it, we, there's a rule in science that you can never prove. Uh, one thing or another. I mean, at best, you could disprove something, but they don't even like to, to talk about disproving things. So if you have uh, if you have a hypothesis that is supported, that's the, that's the argument. Is it supported? Is it not supported? And if it is supported so well by so many things, has never been nothing can ever disprove it. Nothing has ever been able to, to falsify it. There's ways to falsify it if it's wrong, but nobody's ever managed to do that. Uh, and, and it's been supported by so much overwhelming preponderance of evidence for so long, et cetera, that it becomes perverse to question it anymore because it's so well supported. Well, then they don't say that it's been proven true. What they do instead is that it elevates to theory. And uh, theory is the highest level of confidence that science can achieve. Now, that's one way of doing it. And I know that some educators will have a slightly different impression of that. But in, in some terms, we can say that every modern scientific theory is also a fact. Atomic theory you know, is, is a body of knowledge. It's a field of study that includes all of the facts, uh, hypotheses, and, uh, and even natural laws that are applicable to this field of study. So it's a, it's a body of knowledge. And, and so a, atomic theory, the, the germ theory of disease, uh, cell theory of biology, these are all theories. Relativity, for example, they're, but, they're, but they're all also fact because it is you know you can't just say that you know the hiroshima may or may not have happened because atomic theory is just a theory that that makes no sense when you say that it's just a theory it implies that you don't know what you're talking about right yeah i think that's an important distinction is that i mean atomic theory is a theory uh but uh, we would say that atoms exist is a fact because atomic theory is corroborated beyond reasonable doubt. We can do chemistry. So chemistry. See, the, the, I think one of the problems here is that people equate a theory with like a singular datum, like a single sentence, but they fail to understand that theories are actually models that correlate data, right? So you could have a, a set of equations or something. And what they do is they take all of these disparate observations and they, ex and they explain them uh, it, it, uh, under one paradigm, under one model. So 
uh, that's why it's very dishonest in the context of evolution, because evolution itself, I don't think anyone regards evolution as a theory, right? It's a natural phenomenon. And then natural selection is a theory that explains what we see uh, in, in terms of natural phenomena. So it takes genetics and, and phylogeny and morphology and fossils and all of these disparate observations and explains them under one under one model, right? This is what happens to biological organisms. So, so one, one of the um, objection, um, and it's probably prevalent to, uh, around the time of Darwin, Darwin sat on his theory for some 17 years, um, maybe worrying about the repercussions uh, involving humans in, the, in this sort of analogy uh, until Wallace uh, sort of um, was about to release his work and maybe that's what pushed uh, Darwin to start releasing his work. Um, uh, and the, the descent of man is when he started to talk about the maybe a man being part of that particular game. Uh, there are some who would still argue that, um, well, um, animals, yeah, they, they needed to evolve. They are not really made in God's image. However, uh, human beings are completely different. Uh, do we have track records of human beings following, following exactly the same um, biological evolution of other organisms? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the human, as Darwin pointed out, man has been studied more carefully than any other animal. And so when there's a discovery of, you know, various different species of, uh, you know, ver different varieties of deer, for example, they're not all going to make the news. But anything that is close to human is going to make the news. So there, there's going to be news stories about that. There's going to be intensified studies of it. There's going to be propaganda and there's going to be controversy. So everything that is said about that has to be verifiable. It has to be explored in depth where other things are not just, just not even going to be challenged. What's, what's the issue exactly? What's the question in terms of human evolution? So the question is, um, well, they, they don't think humans have evolved at all. They say, well, evolution is all right. So, you know, they're, they're accepted, but only to cover uh, animals. Um, he, right. Humans aren't animals. They're not categorized as animals. We're made we in the, objectively in the are animals. <laughs> yeah. <We> are animals. <laughs> but, um, even, even the Bible, Ecclesiastes right. 3, 18 to 21, even the Bible says that, that, human, that humans are animals. And right. the only reason we don't admit that is because of our vanity. Mm -hmm. So is the problem that people are, are are denying basic biological anthropology and all of the hominin species and, and, and all of that, or or are they saying we don't evolve currently? Well, that, yeah, yeah, you probably remember the infamous um, uh, video, the one that gets the blood boiling every time I watch it, that show me the evidence, one with Dawkins. <laughs> <laughs> that lady kept repeating her, herself and he kept telling her about transitional species. The argument is uh, there are no transitional species to be called. Show Everything. me the evidence. Show me yeah. the evidence. <laughs> it's Google, true. Google list. Of, I, I encourage anyone watching to Google list of transitional fossils. Just put that phrase into your Google search, search bar. You can go to one Wikipedia page and be flabbergasted by all of the myriad uh, specimens you will find there. They just don't look, you know, that's all it is. There was a biologist uh, back in round about Y2K who compiled a list of between three and 400 transitional species, Kathleen Hunt and the transitional fossils uh, mm -hmm. fact. And there's, uh, there's somebody else right now working on an updated list for transitional species where uh, he assures me that, that now it numbers in the thousands. Yeah, because there's really. been a there's been a paleontological boon since the time that Stephen Jay Gould said almost 50 years ago that there weren't many transitions. Mm -hmm. oh, and they importantly, love him. they love to use that quote. <laughs> Catch up yeah. a little bit, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're only 50 years behind the times, and even then, he said that there's not many transitions in the 1970s. There was not many. Now that doesn't mean that there's not any. There's an M there. It's an, it makes an important right. difference. It's like quoting somebody saying like, oh, the internet will never be a big thing. You know, it's like, dude, <laughs> who, what year was that? 1974? Like, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. think there was this uh, Homer Simpsons episode in The Simpsons where he predicted that uh, computers are going to be so huge in the future and they will only be afforded by billionaires. He was wrong. Here's the funniest thing, though, is that um, beyond denying transitional species from the past, from the fossil record, I think that a lot of people are not even aware of 
of the the variety of extant species. There are so many species alive today that have transitional morphology that people just don't even know exist. Like there, people talk about like um, fish to to tetrapods, and it's like there are walking. I mean, you know, you've got the walking fish there. It's like there's all these species that. Um, are very deep in the ocean or they're just like that, you know, I'm doing zoolo zoo zoology content right now and I'm learning about all these animals and I'm just like, I had no idea that these animals existed. And many of them display these very interesting morphologies that are sort of intermediate to what we, the morphologies that we're typically used to. And so you can use that, you, you can use species that are alive today to show various degrees of transitional morphology. You can even do that to argue against things like irreducible complexity, like of the eye. There are so many different types of eyes that are as rudimentary as just a, few, a, a bundle of photoreceptors, all the way to like, you know, varying tiers of complexity, many of which have evolved independently of one another. I think biologists think the eye has evolved like a dozen times totally independently of each other it wasn't just one time so it's just that being able to sense light is a useful adaptation and many times that has happened and it started out very simple and then and so and these are just things that are alive right now they're in the ocean and they're around you know so uh, imagine what could have transpired over a you know a billion years or nearly a billion years it's it's mind-boggling on the right. on the evolution of the eye some people will think that that eyes very much like ours evolved a dozen times. They don't understand there's different types of eyes. Right. So that one of the creationist arguments that I've seen <laughs> recently is where uh, somebody would say that the squid uh, has a similar eye to humans. And so how could that have been? Oh, well, they, well, when it looks, when it doesn't fit evolution, then they call it convergent. But what they don't understand is, you know, the, the squid is like all cephalopods. I mean, all, all cephalopods have a similar structure to their eye, or at least all of the... Uh, I forget that the classic that it includes squids and octopus, but, and, and there's, you know, many, many hundreds of species of both. The thing is what you have a very strong selective pressure when you can tell light from dark at all. Right. And so mm -hmm. if, if, if a trait evolves like that, then there's going to be uh, advantages in keeping it. And one of the ways that you can keep it is you can refine that design or, you can duplicate what you have. And now most other animals went into duplication. So this is where you get compound eyes, right? And so you have some organisms that may have thousands of different lenses. And what they're actually doing is they're trying to compensate for a fundamental de design flaw mm -hmm. that can only be improved by adding more and more lenses all the time. Right. And if they, and if they were able to go with, a, if they went like with some cephalopods, they have this cup kind of eye, that's it. Now they're able to tell direction, and maybe when you when you have a covering over that, where there's where there's, you you just grow, and it, it all of these things grow so easily. Yeah. Um, when you when you get something that works like a lens, you just increasing complexity, and this is all because of you know, every advent every new adaptation offers a new advantage. So there you go. It takes yeah. off. And they're just dictated by the laws of physics, right? This is just a better, you know, and, and, and despite all that, as you just said, there are completely different eyes and completely different approaches to vision in the animal kingdom. So, you know, it's not like, a, like if the human eyeball literally exactly as it is, was found in every single animal species with eyes. Okay. That'd be weird. <laughs> that would take some explaining, but it's not the case. It's completely but random, you know? If you had a creator, you know, if there was like, well, these things, they don't, they don't imply phylogeny. It's not that, you know, the mammals are all have are all similar and, and cephalopods are all similar because they have a common designer. No mammals and cephalopods having a common designer. It does not explain why mammals are similar to mammals and cephalopods are so similar to cephalopods. That implies there's something different about these two groups. What is it? It's the same design. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you can say that, but like the the point is that our our growing understanding of biology makes it increasingly more and more reasonable to say that there was no designer. Right, we're figuring all this out. So you can, there will never be a day where you can't say, well, there's a god that made it all this way, right? But you're not you're not doing anything. It's not scientific. You're not solving anything, right? Uh, we're, we're filling in that gap of, I don't know all the time and explaining it in a naturalistic way. Yeah. So. 
Now, now the evolutionary explanation we have the, at the division of protostomes and deuterostomes, we're mm -hmm. very near there. Uh, we have a development of blood based on two different things, hemocyanin in one group and, and uh, hemoglobin in the other. And so you end up with all of the descendants of this line have red blood and, and all the descendants of this line have blue blood. And that makes sense. You see all of these protostomes, they have blue blood, right? Like lob lobsters, scorpions, things like this. They, they, they have blue blood or it's based on that. Some of them even have red blood, but it's like a secondary mutation. It's still based on hemocyanin right. or a, a, a new variant that, that evolved after. But what if you had a designer, then it wouldn't you wouldn't have this one derived synapomorphy that applies yeah. all to this group. You would have interchangeable things. Sure. You know, I mean, so so Why? we would have human eyes suddenly appearing in insects somewhere, right. or there would be a mammal that had compound eyes because God just felt like that one day. Or, or on the molecular level, just a completely different polymerase enzyme, unrelated, right? You know, just uh, because the God just said, "You'll have this one, you'll have that one," right? The 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 evidence. It's not so much evidence against a designer. It's just that everything falls perfectly into this tree of life that is explained perfectly by evolutionary principles makes the designer unnecessary. So, you know, you can always, always say, yep, the God, it's this way. And the God said, that's how it's going to be. Well, all right. But, you know, <laughs> it's there's no there's nothing to support that. You know, to uh, me, you um, don't need one. It's superfluous. So. Yeah, what I, what I was thinking about evolution the other day, it's almost sort of, sort of akin to me in, 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 uh, to the Big Bang Theory in, in terms of somebody who's really running the tape backwards. Um, uh, this was an understanding of silos of all these species are sort of uh, existing independent of each other the way they, they are, this is the way they were created. And somebody started to run the tape backwards uh, to realize, well, Bloody hell, I think we've all uh, descended from um, uh, one common ancestor. So it's, it's rewinding the tape backwards. Um, and I was going to ask Aaron that question. Um, do squids and octopus um, uh, have uh, the blind spot uh, caused by the back-to-front issue with the, the human eye? The, the only commonality between the, the, their, the, the cephalopod eye and the human eye is that there's uh, is that they're both camera eyes, you know, the, the concept of a camera, although theirs works more like a camera than ours does because of the way that their their lens focuses as opposed to the way our lens focuses. So there's there's structural fundamental differences. in The, the only commonality is they're, they're both basically a camera type eye, you know, fundamentally. But but the position and the movement of the lens is is very different. The The, the structure of the eye is very different. We have blood veins on the inside of our mm -hmm. eye that, that, that create this blind spot that we have to constantly, you know, flutter our, our eyes around in order to get around. And it also causes distortion in our vision where we sometimes see the veins in our eyes reflected in the sunlight in our eyes so far where the, the cephalopods wouldn't have that because their veins are on the outside of that membrane. So they, they neither have the blind spot, nor do they have the, the, the veins showing up. So actually their eyes are in that sense better than our eyes are. So why would God make their eyes better and build our eyes backwards? Maybe they're the supreme species. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they think so. <laughs> Maybe they've got a whole culture we don't know about, you know. So this is going to lead us on. We're, we're saying a little bit, sort of a little a, a bit around the Darwin's era because uh, the, the missing link, uh, this is almost an over 100 years old uh, story, but unfortunately, this has still been repeated as if it's a contemporary issue. The missing link, though, we, we're still looking for that half monkey, half man <laughs> guy. Because um, so that's, that. that's a question you ask him. So, what do you expect? What, what would be a transitional species for you? What would be the missing link for you? And they, that's what they will tell you half man, half monkey, like waist down, covered in fur. <laughs> and then have, like like a centaur but not with a horse <laughs> yeah I, I i get that transitional species are supposed to be half formed so they wouldn't be able to live half can you draw me a picture of it no, they, they can't they won't right even when they've seen 
uh, Rudy Zellinger's like March of Progress painting, right? You, you, from the monkey to the, and you see all of these transitions. Now we realize that, that back then they were talking about like a continuous chain of being and it's really a branching tree where they draw it all as one line. And I get that, that that's not a scientifically accurate depiction, but you should still be able to look at that and realize that, hey, nobody who accepts evolution is talking about a monkey one day giving birth to a man nor nor for like a a half chimpanzee on one side and half human on the other or any of whatever bullshit they bring up down the, the middle would be fun like two face <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the the reason that they do that, i mean think about this when darwin predicted darwin predicted two transitional species specifically he didn't apparently think that we would ever find a fish with feet and and of course <coughs> he did but he, he predicted Archaeopteryx, and he predicted Australopithecus. He gave the descriptions of what a transitional species should be like, and within two years of publication, we get Archaeopteryx. So we, we, he, he was alive still when he found out that his theory had been vindicated. But here, 150 years later, the creationists still refuse to admit they an the a transitional species ever was discovered. Mm -hmm. And then a hundred years later, they discover Australopithecus again, exactly fits Darwin's description. And it wasn't just that one species. It wasn't just that one individual. I mean, there, there's a Dozens. whole, yeah, there's, there's hundreds of individuals from that particular species. And there's, then there's like a dozen genera that, that fit the molds. I mean, we found mm -hmm. oodles. We found plenty to, to fit his criteria for what that was. But, Will the creationists admit that? Of course, right. because they, well, they of don't. course not, because they can't. They won't. Hom they Hominin species are all either monkeys or humans to them. Even the though morphologically, is, is it, it's just not true. It's just the, not true morphologically. The problem is with the, these people is that they're they have a belief system, and so they want to pretend that we have a belief system. And I, mm. I'm sorry to put things in terms of us or them, but there is there is kind of a dichotomy here when we're talking about whether you're going to accept reality or make believe something else. And that's exactly what the wanna believers are doing. They are misrepresenting the facts so that they can make believe what they know, right. in many cases, what they know is not really true. If I've had people admit to me that they know it's not true, but they're going to believe it anyway. And from the scientific perspective, if you find I had ideas, I had hypotheses that I thought would be borne out in time, and then it turned out that they weren't. And so I, I would have to admit that, hey, I once thought that that turtles, for example, I, I thought that turtles would turn out to be the last surviving group of anapsids. And it turned out that they are not. They are diapsid reptiles. And there was we found the evidence. Uh, a, a friend of mine actually found the evidence to prove otherwise. And I just have to admit, well, nope, nope, they are. I was wrong. Mm -hmm. But the so, believers can't do that because well, that's, yeah, that's why propaganda is crafted that very cleverly. Or if you want to deny the uh, the identity and morphology of hominin species, then if propaganda is crafted to tell you that it's a lie, you'll just believe it. Right. This one here is a little bit sort of for the scientific communities. I think the faithful is, uh, are not going to, to worry too much about it. Species. Um, is it? Is it really helpful? I know taxonomy has been always a bit dicey. It's a bit difficult. Is the word species even scientifically accurate? Is it? Does it sound like more like a race, like it's a human construct? And we're thinking of of organisms in in silos where things are distinguished, rather than a spectrum where things move in spectrum. And there there really isn't a point where you can tell one from the other, and they're moving into like the the shades of fifty shades of gray where you can't tell the picture, but it's not distinct, but nevertheless, maybe the, the, that human construct is is so um, helpful for indexing and organizing. And uh, what do you reckon, Iron? Is it is it something that we should hold on to, or the, the biological species concept is useful if for if no for no other reason in this particular argument, in that it perfectly matches the biblical definition of a kind. It's whether two two animals are closely related enough that they can still bring forth after their kind, meaning can they interbreed and produce viable interfertile offspring? And when they can't, you know, we, we know that the, as organisms, you know, populations grow more and more separate, more and more distinct, the, the subtle variances build up until there's less and less inclination to reproduce or less and less ability to do so. And so you get to a point where hybrids between the two are no longer interfertile with both groups. 
So and when that happens, you, you, you just continue on until they, they don't interbreed at all. They can't produce anything alive at all. And then they can no longer bring forth after their kind. So it's exactly the same definition. But believers, and the believers will still cite that definition, not understanding what it means, and then try to push the, the, the goalposts to some higher taxonomic level to where it's instead of producing a new species, well, now it produces a new genus or it produces a whole new family. Because you know some of them just put it, push it right up the ranks, and they deliberately refuse to uh, understand what m the word macro evolution means. You know, variation at, at or above the level of species, including the emergence of new species. They'll accept that new genus can happen. They'll accept that new families can happen, but they won't call it evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the problem here is that the word species, with, you know, with the defi the biological definition we're talking about, that describes a population of organisms that that can produce viable offspring, but it doesn't necessarily describe every potential biological life form, right? When speciation is occurring, you have this gradient, right, where things are getting more vague, right? Uh, and so, you know, when when you're producing, what you know, when speciation is occurring, which we have observed, by the way, I like to point this out to agreement, we have observed species. <laughs> speciation events um you know they they want to talk about how do you get a new genus how do you get a new family well right you you're just getting speciation and then if you have a new population of organisms that is genetically distinct from a previous one it's about the lineage that occurs from there right how much genetic diversity is going to come from the the, the descendants of those organisms right it's not just like ooh, a speciation of a new phylum happened or a speciation of a new it's not like we, we have to see what is going to transpire from that point? How much diversity is going to occur from those organisms and their ancestor, or sorry, their 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 offspring, their progeny? What will be the divergence, the the di divergent events from that point forward? Right, the Linnaean classification. It's, it's just a way of categorizing all of the mm -hmm. organisms. Right, it's not like oh, oh, nature decided there's a new class today. Like it's I, you know, it's just how we keep track of stuff but. so that's that's why it's indexing organizations for us it's not ontologically uh, uh true for uh, an organism and this is where it's going to take us to speciation because you know we, um, we've been witness you know the london underground mosquito for example but uh, and, and that's a that's a uh, an example for, for speciation, but it still will be argued that, well, well, that's another type of mosquito might not be able to interbreed with the other. It's mosquito. not a pine tree. <laughs> <But it's> not... <laughs> the, that remind me of that conversation. That's that was a funny one, but, uh, but they're, they're expecting an elephant to come out of that process. Right. Yeah, my, my favorite example, I think is, is, is when they convicted fraud in Charlatan, the inmate number 0645-2017. Lest we speak his name. <laughs> <laughs> came up with the idea that maybe hamsters would grow out of corn stalks or something like that. And because he's he's trying to misunderstand this as much as he can. He, he knows how we can get how we can derive new species of corn. He knows how the spe how the parent species of all corn was derived from grass. Right, but but they simply won't accept that this is evolution. They have to come up with a straw man misrepresentation of it, such that you have one kind turn into another fundamentally different kind, which is not what evolution ever taught, and that violates at least two evolutionary laws. Right. If if the if if the proof of evolution that such a liar is looking for were to occur, it would disprove evolution. <laughs> And it would imp it would it would prove that there's a god just magically making new forms uh, on a whim, you know. Uh, I think that like the 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 unwillingness to to um, comprehend geologic timescales is that right, all they need to do is just deny that stuff takes a long time, right? You, they could say, oh, you know, the Himalayans are caused by the you know the 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 collision of of the Indian plate with the, with the Eurasian plate. I don't believe it. Why don't we see uh, new mountain ranges happening every day? Right. Well, it takes a long time. Well, how do you know? Okay. Do you want me to go over the, you know, geology 101? Do we want to talk about mid ocean rifts and then the magnetic striping and the, like, we figured this out, this happens. Here's all of the evidence for plate tectonics. We know that plate tectonics uh, is accurate and there's not a single geologist on earth that does not operate under the framework of, of plate tectonics. And so I'm sorry that things take millions of years. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that we can't all see all of this incredible, you know, uh, emergence of new forms. It, it takes too long. We don't live that long. But, 
that doesn't make it wrong and there's nothing i can do about that for you you know yeah i gotta so. i gotta point out something to you and please i gotta apologize for my parrot who thinks he's a cat i thought it was a cat i really thought it was a cat. <laughs> that's brilliant yeah, yeah. that that is my parrot being very loud from a good distance away wow uh, that is brilliant <laughs> One of the analogies that I like to use, because do, do people want to want to believe something that is impossible? They know it's impossible. They're going to find any excuse they can to be absolutely convinced of a thing they know never happened and couldn't happen. But they're going to reject walls of evidence, proof. They're going to reject proof that it did happen or that this other thing happened that they don't want to believe in. So it's a it's an enormous double standard, and yep. the way that they the way that they misunderstand evolution deliberately uh, is, I think, best counteracted by by looking at the evolution of language. And my my favorite example of that is you know we have Spanish, French, and Italian, uh, and um, Romanian. These are all Latin based languages. Now, uh, Spanish, French, and Romanian. Are, are an example of cladogenesis, which, uh, you know, you have the Latin speakers moved on into different parts of Europe, and there then the languages grew increasingly diverse. This is a population level change. Perfect. Nobody understand. nobody thinks that there was one guy who suddenly started speaking. I made up Italian. my own language. <laughs> yeah, there's it, not like but, I but, speak you know, French like, now. <laughs> Ray yeah. Comfort would say that it would say that you know the, the evolution of dogs was like there's an amorphous mass of hamburger that sat around for millions of years and suddenly grew eyes, legs, and a tail, and then had to go find another piece of hamburger that suddenly sprouted into a right. female version of that dog. Yeah. He's lying to deliberately misrepresent the facts. Yeah. But what really happened is we know that there was never some first guy to speak French who, you yeah. know, walking amongst a bunch of Latin speakers who then had to go find somebody else to speak French to. And you there's know? also never someone who precisely half of his vocabulary was Latin and half of his vocabulary was French. Very true. It's Very. it's a population of, pe of, of people whose language collectively slowly changes over time. Yeah, considering when you think about adaptation in that way as well, if language is, is made to communicate with others and and and, uh, and thoughts uh, and the means, uh, then yep. uh, on the genetic, uh, if you're dealing with the environment around you and and and, and other species around you, uh, they almost serve as a language. Um, so yeah. it, it, it needs it's to, a perfect to, to change collectively. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah. there's a couple um, ways that a couple other ways in which that works. We know that just in the last few hundred years. You know, English people moved to all these different parts of the world where, you know, Americans and the Australians and so and, and so on have different accents now. Right. So we can see that happening more or less to the point that they can't really deny it. Right. And so we can see that these you know, the Spanish, French, Italian, these are all definitely based on Latin. And it, it wasn't like they spoke Latin up until this one day and then suddenly everybody spoke Italian. You can find like old Spanish literature from, you know, like inter and in the interim period or the intermediate period. And you can see, well, it's not really it, it's still a Latin language, but it's not exactly it's not Roman Latin anymore. And it's not quite Spanish yet. It's definitely yeah. not becoming French. And you can do all of this with evolution too, but but the, but the people who want to be short sighted on this are keep trying to think of like instantaneous changes in a single individual and everything. And when you explain it in terms of language, now they understand this is population level changes, small changes, never the abrupt sudden changes that they're asking for. Yeah, this is really funny. The the language is the perfect analogy because I was debating a Muslim on Derek's um, Myth Vision channel yesterday, and I brought the analogy of a dead language, a language that is sort of resistant to 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 adapt to new to reflect uh, new thoughts. And the guy was very very um, proud of Arabic being the oldest language in the world, which is incorrect. <laughs> that's false. That's not that's not true. And, and it, it hasn't changed over time. And he thought this was a feature. And I thought, mate, your, your language is about to die out, uh, off if, if this is the case. This is what, exactly how languages sort of uh, disappear over time. So it's exactly like natural selection. And if you're not going to adapt and your, um, uh, your language is going to end up being exactly in the same uh, area where uh, the extinct species, species eventually go to. And in fact, there are, you can find all these little like extinct languages that were, you know, didn't really make it because not enough people spoke them. <laughs> yeah. Also another purpose, yeah. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. Now, uh, so we, we talked about, uh, this is another uh, attack um, 
observation. Well, they reckon science. One of the science, one of the pillars of science is observation. And you're telling me a speciation takes a minimum of two million years, sometimes five million years, because of genetic drifts and geographical geographical drifts. Uh, how am I supposed to um, uh, verify that? And one of the pillars of science is to observation, and that's not attainable when it comes to speciation. Well, we also want to con confirm that, that that not everything takes millions of years. There are some things that, that can happen in as few as 100 generations, sometimes even less. And so there's rapid speciation. I mean, there's, there's various levels of evolution that can occur uh, under direct observation by a single individual in a laboratory. But other levels of change require a longer period of time. And you can still see the, the intermediate steps. It just needs, you know, you just have to zoom. It's like when you're looking at Google Maps, you know, there's some things you can see up close and other things you just have to zoom out a bit. If you want to see the whole state, you're going to have to zoom out a bit. If you want to see the whole country, zoom out a little bit mm -hmm. further. It's the same concept. Yeah, it just depends on the magnitude of the evolutionary pressure, right? If there's a stimulus that's very strong, you you, you could tend to get more ra uh, rapid uh, evolutionary change. I mean, I think that sometimes they use as evidence the the idea that there are organisms that have not changed very much morphologically for millions of years, you know, like sharks or something. It's like, well, why didn't they evolve? And like, well, they didn't need to. They're doing just fine. Like, you know, there's not a lot of pressure for them to change because they're so suited morphologically for their environment you know but if there's some very specific environmental stress such as one we could even manufacture deliberately in a laboratory setting then probably that thing that will be a, a different situation you know yeah so, so i'm glad you mentioned that the species that don't need to they don't have, they don't have the same pressure that they they're not in a hurry to change they're they're yeah. quite e effective in their environment why don't uh, rabbits grow wings <laughs> <laughs> one of the dumbest things yeah. anyone has ever said but, uh, well, I wanted that's to the explain. thing I think that, that's yeah. the thing that re really needs to be addressed to me uh, it, it's this whether you're going to accept reality or whether you're going to just believe on faith and what does that mean it, increasingly we see that, that faith means you know asserting that things are true that or that you know that things are true that you don't know to be true and you can't show to be true right? pretending to know what you don't know and and rejecting everything and anything you don't there's always moving the goalposts there's every logical fallacy is employed i don't understand where the desperation is i can understand that some people are afraid of, of death maybe maybe they're afraid of the uncertainties somebody was arguing with me the other day saying that the, that the thing that they didn't like about science was that science didn't have certainty and religion did I'm like well yeah but but everybody who's wrong is certain about their being wrong Mm -hmm. Yeah, they the, just don't uh, know that they're wrong because they're certain about it. The infinite certainty is how you know it's wrong. But but it isn't even a certainty. I mean, it's a certainty in after you die, sort of things. Like after you die, you get paid. So like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, uh, I can't really guarantee that either. Um, uh, what was I? I was going to talk about the um, the observation bit and oh the. Um, Changes uh, are always kind of costly, um, and there is a, a trade-off uh, in terms of it. So you, uh, we still have a lot of issues because the cost to change them might uh, be a lot more uh, higher than uh, what we afford to. So they're, they're working fine for now, but maybe, Aaron, if you can tell, tell us about the, the trade-offs in, in adaptation and, and if sometimes are too expensive to change. Well, I'm, I'm trying to think of what whatever you you whatever example you might be thinking of. You, so, for example, the 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 nerve that runs from the foot all the way to the head. Nerve, you know, that, that oh, well, yeah. yeah, you you can't you can't make a fundamental change. I mean, with with auto designers, like the, the example that I use is like the Volkswagen Beetle, right? So you 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 it had a rear it had a rear engine, aluminum engine, and all of this, and then a, and a, a stick shift, and then later suddenly. It becomes a water-cooled front engine with an automatic transmission. Designers can do that, but evolution can't. Evolution has to has to make minor modifications mm -hmm. to what's already there, where they're stuck with the design. It can't it can't decide to hey, let's put a Chevy V8 in that. No, a designer can do that. Mm -hmm. Evolution cannot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sentience required for major modifications. Yeah. But yeah, that pharyngeal nerve, I, I, I think that's what it's called of the giraffe. Yeah, it's a great example. Yeah. It's completely nonsensical from a design perspective. But what are you going to do? The neck got longer and 
that's what's inside the neck. <laughs> so, yeah. You know. So it makes it makes sense in a fish, you know, because of distance. And uh, but once you go into from cold blooded to hot yeah. blooded, it becomes a bit tricky. Um, now we we go back to the the issue of humans um, uh, and and speciation. Uh, is natural selection is one of the most uh, the major drives of, of evolution because uh, let's face it, evolution wasn't really a new concept when Darwin came up with it. Uh, his grandfather Rasmussen was talking about it, or talks about it, but he's the one that said, "Well, natural selection is the real, uh, really main drive here." Uh, didn't understand so much about genetics, you know. He's, he's used some certain basic ideas. Uh, uh, then it evolved over time. Uh, what other sciences, uh, neighbor sciences, that uh, vindicate? Uh, evolution and confirm evolution that are not really uh, sort of biology, biology related. Okay, well, I would think obviously yeah. geology. Yeah, right? would be so, one. yeah. So we we have a number of different uh, fields of science. I mean, it, uh, cosmology, of course, and, uh, and and genetics would would technically not be exactly the same. Uh, at least at least not in the when they were initially discovered, they didn't see them you know, as being exactly evolution. So I mean, it's it's a, and all of these, of course, correlate and cross confirm, and everything lines up with. And you have all these different lines of evidence that, that everything matches, and you're still holding to maybe absolutely everything we know about anything is wrong, so that this thing that I know is wrong can still be true. Yeah, the inconsistency in the application of skepticism is astounding, right? Uh, the entire edifice of science that has been arrived at over hundreds of years by thousands of brilliant individuals studying these natural phenomena their entire lives. I don't like that. Versus there's some stuff in a book from a long time ago that checks out. We're good to go. You know, <laughs> it's um, but but yeah, it's it's I think the it, as you said, fear of mortality uh, or potentially even more so the uh, discomfort of rearranging one's identity and worldview is yeah that that's a the main that's a deterrent. thing isn't it um, yeah. when you when you put your identity behind it and now you've just refused to change your mind because you can't mm -hmm. yeah the psychological discomfort is too strong um is id intelligent design a, a viable competitive uh i, I don't want to call it theory because I, I won't i won't dare to call it that but uh, Intelligent design creationism meets exactly none of the criteria required of a scientific theory. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is religion trying to Trojan horse its way into science is the way I put it in my latest debunk. <laughs> yeah, because it, do it doesn't provide uh, an alternative theory. It just says this. This is not uh, evolution is impossible. That's what it says, really, right? Yeah, it's it's a propaganda movement trying to poke holes in science, right? If, if intelligent design, you know, they they try to dress it up as science because the newest wave is for the is for the religious scholar that wants to feign compatibility with science, right? There 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 are low totem pole science deniers that just want to deny science, but then there are those who want to, they want it to be science because they understand the validity of science in the realm, you know, in the sense that we produce technology, right? Science has to have value, right? So they will try to put forward things like irreducible complexity that, that are just flawed, you know, from, from, uh, from the get go. Uh, and, and, try to obfuscate the fact that all they're really doing is going evolution is wrong, right? Evolution can't be true because this, it's not a model that explains anything or makes any predictions at its essence. It's God did it. That's the whole thing. Yeah. It's the assumption that if science can't explain it, therefore magic. Right. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a classic uh, argument from personal incredulity, basically, really it's argument from ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. And polished and dressed up as as magnificently as, as possible to try to trick the their the the target of the propaganda that wants to feign as much com compatibility with science as possible, right? They these are the people who don't want to deny science; they want to pretend that their magic is science. Yeah. So there are two, there are three, three or four guys. You know, it's C. Meyer. We know the Discovery Institute guy. We've got Michael Behe. Um, who uh, um, uh, talks about irreducible complexity. And I think he brings forth usually the examples of the mouse trap and the 
bacterium flagellum and and things like that and uh, yeah. basically saying well the cell is so complicated and so complex there isn't enough time uh, and the, the computer scientist guy comes along and does some weird mathematical wizardy to come they up with a numbers. number that says well this is one in trillion and you know i think uh, uh, what do you think about this is, is it true do you think a, a cell is there enough time for a cell to to, to be that complex yeah, it evolves over time. I mean, see, this is what Tour does as well. Is just they show clips of uh, of of the marvel the, the marvelous complexity of modern eukaryotic cells that have evolved over billions of years, and go, how did that all just poof? Like, it didn't do that. That's not <laughs> what happened, and no one is suggesting that. Right. That's why what I've been doing uh, with Origin of Life research has been a great learning experience for me because I'm trying to help people understand how things can have arrived to such complexity. I mean, anyone who puts forward anything about a eukaryotic cell uh, is just it's just like the, the dishonesty is mind boggling. Right. Life was exclusively prokaryotic for a billion years. And mm -hmm. within that billion years, there was tremendous uh, 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 ev evolution as well. So, but these things about like the bacterial flagellum and stuff have been debunked six ways to Sunday so many times, but they keep putting them forward because the explanations that constituted a debunking of that require moderate understanding of molecular biology. And so it's very easy for someone who doesn't want to hear that to ignore it because there's a lot of words in there that they, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard, it's hard to explain. Right. This isn't so much the like, you know, the language analogy and all these things. I think a lot of people can wrap their heads around that. But when you get down to the level of molecular biology, it's not that easy. It's 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 hard enough to understand that if you really don't want to understand it, it's going to be just fine for you to brush it away. Right. Yeah. But that's why I'm going after these guys now more than the Kent Hovens of the world, because Behe and Dembski and these guys, it's more sophisticated. They're more sophisticated lies. And I yeah. want to I want to try to to disarm those ones because I think it'll have a trickle down effect where those who perceive themselves as scholars of this pseudoscience, um, can, if I can get those people uh, to see that this stuff doesn't hold any water, I think that, that that may rain down on on the rest. Maybe those will say, ah, I, I see I've fall, fallen for this and in their circles, maybe disseminate uh, some kind of logic to those around them. So this is a yeah, question yeah. for Aaron when he's ready. Um, you know, one of the things they're talking about is that the mouse trap and uh, almost in a and sort of breaking down the mouse trap parts into uh, the different parts of it, and then claiming that these parts are fundamental. They they were found the way they are, and kind of ignoring that they these parts could have evolved in their own rights as well. Um, uh, you know, as as if they were found that way. They were complex the way they were found. As if it's a it's a blueprint or a code. Uh, by a designer. Yeah, these people are very confused. I mean, they, they want to imagine that complexity implies design, when in fact, it, one of the hallmarks of intelligent design would be an efficient simplicity. Mm -hmm. And we don't, have a, we don't have an impressive efficiency anywhere in biochemistry, but we do have a, a staggering, unnecessary complexity. Uh, yeah. the, the kind of complexity that we have implies a haphazard configuration of, of the blind watchmaker kind of trial and error thing, yeah. not an intelligent design of you know divine and perfect being. It, why it, why does a biosynthetic pathway take twelve steps and twelve different enzymes when we can do it in the lab in three? Right. It's... Exactly. I mean, when I when I was to, when I I remember being in science class and note and when they were teaching uh, photosynthesis. And when you get into the you get into the weeds on photosynthesis, you, you're like, why it's would so somebody design such a Rube Goldberg system as this? Right. It's insane. <laughs> it's crazy. Unless it's an accumulation of bits and pieces that have been put together, because as Aaron said, once you've got that fundamental model, yeah. you can't really uh, you, you can't, you can't start from the beginning. You, can, no. you have to keep building on it. Another the, the, important point about that, if if, if I may, and I'm sorry to yeah, no, I'll go after you. Yeah. Okay, so um, statistically, um, engineers and mathemat mathematicians are the ones who are most likely to believe in a God-type character, whereas uh, geologists and biologists almost exclusively don't, you know, unless you're like a medical doctor and you don't have like a whole lot of, you know, world experience in, you know, zoology or what have you. But as, as far as the, the 
mathematicians and the engineers and everything, one of the things that they should realize is that, I mean, there are people like Benoit Mendelbrot who, who said that you can create a whole universe just based on very few rules. If you have this kind of replication where it's, it, if there's any room for imperfection at all, then evolution becomes inevitable and, and this is going to happen and you can create a, a, a fantastic universe of incredible diversity with very simple rules. So which one is the intelligent designer? The one who goes through all of these ridiculously complex systems when we know it could be made much simpler and much more effective or the guy who creates the world with the very few simple rules and just turns the computer on and lets yep. it do the rest itself. That's right. Yeah, that's a much more believable God and much more unoffensive God, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to continue with that with that thread and the earlier thread, I mean, with, with molecular biology stuff, I think that the main thing that creationists are not grasping is that they think that any functional protein in a biological system um, can, can only have that very specific structure, which is just unbelievably and demonstrably false, right? You, you, you have a protein and they'll cite, this is where they like to do the number game, right? It's a one in 120 trillion billion probability okay you are pretending that that structure for that protein is the only one that will that will allow it to function properly which is insane if you know anything about protein structure you have a protein with hundreds and hundreds of amino acid residues and you think that if this one nowhere near the active site changes from leucine to isoleucine that it suddenly is not going to work anymore. That is going to have zero effect on the efficacy of the protein. You have a few really integral residues in the active site of an enzyme or a receptor. And if one of those changes, yeah, you're maybe it's not going to work anymore, but you have, I mean, it goes so far as like their polymerase enzymes or certain really cr crucial enzymes are, are, have different, uh, have different uh, sequences in different biological organisms and they achieve the same task. So even within things that are currently alive, we know that that proteins do not have to have the same sequence to do the same task. But then think of all the possibilities. Take any enzyme and start playing with any residue you want. OK, this one right here could have been 14 out of the 20 residues and it won't change anything about the folding structure. This one over here could have been 18. Right. It doesn't. Most of the residues can have tremendous variability. It's only maybe five to 10 in the active site of something like an, en uh, an enzyme, where if you change that, it may have an effect on the efficacy of the enzyme. And it may not even make it completely uh, non-functional. It may make it a little less functional, a little more functional. So nature very clearly arrives at proteins that have some kind of function. And then those are retained uh, in, in an evolutionary context because the, then they are refined over time. So like the, the, the binding affinity over time, mutations will increase the binding affinity so that the enzyme becomes more and more uh, effective. But the, the, but the, the form was there. It got something that did something fairly well and then it hang, it hung on to it. And then that got better over a billion years. That's why we have enzymes today that that are that are admittedly highly efficient at that task that that enzyme is for. It it didn't nature didn't go here we go I got it right and th these uh, these en these enzymes these proteins they're they're changing over time. Because you know? Dave, one of the conflations we've got always is a conflation that leads up to a lot of confusion uh, of, of evolution and biogenesis. Uh, there's always a conversation where the two are sort of mixed together in a strange uh, form. But if we track down the whole story with 13.7 billion years, we're talking uh, cosmology and physics, physics, mm -hmm. and we have chemistry, we've got biochemistry, and then we've got biology. Um, so we're, we're talking about initial conditions here, and, and, and the, 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 they're talking about the miracle of the inanimate uh, tra uh, transforming into animate. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a book by uh, Edwin Schrodinger, uh, the famous physicist the, the, the cat guy uh, and it's called what is life mm -hmm. and he's basically talking about the uh, the cell um, a, as the first attempt to um, challenge entropy by conserving the information within the the lipids uh, now are uh, are the building blocks of life uh, abundantly available are they available are they in space are they everywhere um, Yes, or, or yeah, the building, yeah, the building blocks of the building blocks, as some of them like to call them. Yes, they are universally abundant. We can see them in space. 
we find them on meteors and stuff. I mean, this is even amino acids, which are, you know, so yeah, that's only the first step of a hundred, but yes, to answer your question, absolutely. Those building blocks are readily available. We can use spectroscopic techniques to see that they are everywhere. So. Yeah. One of the other arguments that I think is amusing is it, is it, if you have this, as was suggested before this, uh, the, 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 the God who devises the system and lets it run on automatic, right? Um, that's not the God they want. No. Because if we're talking about the creationists, then whether they're Muslim or whether they're Christian, they want their book to be God, effectively. They, the, yeah. the book can't be wrong because then God is wrong. Some way or other, you may be able to do, to like overlook some of the details, but you want that book to have authority. Mm-hmm. You want and that what book it says you been... can do about your genitals and all of the other things. That <laughs> exactly. Goes with it. Yeah. The, the thing is, is that even if there was a God, Genesis didn't happen. No. Evangelical Christians, you know, like uh, uh, Francis Collins, uh, the director of the National uh, Institutes of Health, he was the director of the Human Genome Project. He admits Adam and Eve could not have happened. We know that that didn't happen. The global flood of Noah's Ark, uh, the the Tower of Babel, the Jonah in the fish slash whale. <laughs> None of that stuff. The Exodus didn't happen. Moses didn't exist. None of that is real. It yeah. doesn't matter if there is a God. Evolution is still true. The Bible is still false. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the problem. They want the Bible or the Quran to be true. Yeah. That's why I push back against this angry atheist trope, because my atheism is not a big part of my identity. I really don't care. There are you there. There, there are plenty of people who believe in God that it is com- totally unoffensive to 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 my worldview and, and to society in general. Right. It's just this these particular kinds of gods that that you're describing here that that tell us what we're allowed to do and what the laws should be uh no that i reject and you're objectively wrong right but um but no it's i i don't it's not a belief in god in some general way that offends me or i that i think is uh that is uh deleterious to to society right yeah there are plenty of people who believe in god it's totally fine i don't <laughs> i don't care you know? Yeah, it's not just the, the the moral dictates, which are not moral, by the way. You know, we we, we hear all the time that, that the United States, you know, we teach in school in Texas that the United States was founded on a covenant between God and Moses. Bullshit. And it doesn't matter how many historians it will come down and testify that, no, we have proof that that is not the case, that yeah. it's not, you know, it doesn't matter because they want to think that, that God is... Uh, has guided our country and even when they admit sometimes accidentally when they admit that they know that that's not the case they say well we have to teach the, teach it like it is anyway because we want we want everyone to believe that you know god is a, that that uh united states is founded by and led by god that they'll lose hope if they don't believe we that. have to lie to children don't you yes, know that exactly. we have to propagandize children? How else are you going to brainwash them into doing what you want them to do? You have to do this. <laughs> so it's all about manipulation of the masses through deliberate yeah. deception. And yeah. that's, you know, that's my angry atheism. It's not just yeah. what they do with science. It's what they do with history. It's what they do with, with, with sex ed. It's what they do. It's, it's how they are undermining everything. Yes. Well, Hitch, I, Hitch's, uh, Hitch's had a right. I think his subtext of uh, subtitle of his book was, uh, had, you know, had wanted to be provocative, but I think he was onto something when he said poisons everything, literally yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah when, I mean, when look it at, is look at religion tried to infuse how, in society, you know, that's look, all. Look how, look how religion has been the, the block against progress in every application that it has ever touched. Where does it try to retard or repeat, impede or reverse progress in general? I mean, so when I was a little kid, I was, I, I was raised by a bunch of religious people who told me that progress is bad. And if you, if, you know, that everything good is to go back to the good old days, whatever the good old days were. And that appears to be some time when only straight, white, Protestant, Christian, rich men had rights. Right. Progress would mean I might not own everything. We don't want that. <laughs> but, but I to, might to not be able the, to do anything I want with no impunity. <laughs> to, to cut the faithful folks some slack, do you think, so we'll probably all agree here that we did not evolve to understand um, uh quantum mechanics or uh, large celestial, we, we, we evolved to survive, right? Right. Um, right? 
So it's uh, quite impressive really, that we understand anything at all. Oh, yeah. that's yeah, absolutely. I agree. If there is if there is a miracle, that's it that we're talking about this right now, <laughs> instead of just throwing bananas at each other. <laughs> and and again, if you want to if you want to imagine the god that creationists don't want to believe in. Right. The, 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 how about the God that says, you know what? I want people to understand. I don't speak people. I don't speak to people. I don't write books because books will be translated and edited and confused and corrupted. But what I can do is I can create a fossil record in the rocks and I can create all this evidence in every other application of science, all these applications of science. And so they will be able to say, hey, you know, we've got these fossils that all indicate this. We've got this genetic record. We've got these genetic orthologs that indicate this. All, And they're all telling the same story. Now, that would be a God worth worshiping, but yeah. they don't want that God. They want the God that says, chop the, chip, chop the tip off your, your son's penis, because that's the one design flaw I made. They, I gave everybody a tip to their penis that, that should yeah. be on recall. They want a God that rewards them for not using the brain he gave them. It's, it's, that's, that's a dilemma. But, but don't you agree, then, um, at some point... Uh, that one idea that sort of united group of people for them to, to believe in something and then maybe survive um, some adversities and some issues would have been at some point uh, like the tale we needed and it was helpful, but it's uh, it's no longer needed. It's fastidious now. It's, it, it's it, it, We need to get rid of, but it was helpful at some time. Well, it, there's no, there's not always a lot of desperate need to get rid of something just because it isn't useful. So we can hang on to things for a long time that aren't useful. Uh, I used to have a pet emu, and one of the interesting features about that was that it has these tiny little arms, not wings, arms, yes. like a tyrannosaur has. You know those itty-bitty arms that are useless? And on the end of that, it has one finger, and on the end of that finger is a little sickle-shaped claw. Hmm. None of that makes any, makes any difference, especially since this animal has no musculature connecting to that anymore. The emu is not able to move its arms. So what possible purpose could there be in a claw mm -hmm. very true very true um so we've got we've got a few things to cover and uh, so another five or ten minutes and then do you, do you guys mind if we have another 15 minutes towards the end for just to take questions from the audience sure fantastic so in in about 10 minutes guys we're, we're going to start uh, to take uh, questions if you want to start preparing them um now with the biogenesis we go back to the cell situation so we've got the three distinct parts you know you've got your your dna which is the passes on the inherited uh, traits you've got the lipids or you know to keep the the uniformity and um, the, the the shape of the of the cell and you've got the protein which is supposed to 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 power your functions uh now with uh, the rna hypothesis and don't forget the, the cells soul that makes it all animate <laughs> secret ingredient Crucial ingredient yeah <laughs> do, you, do you think the rna fixes the problem of of the protein because you know that they're always saying oh you need that many proteins and they're very complex and how you know that, that needs a lot of uh, energy would an rna because rna can do the functions of proteins as well at the same time it's a it's one helix so it's less complex would it fix the problem Yes, an RNA an RNA first world is seems to be pretty clearly the case. Yeah, because RNA can have catalytic function, uh, and we are finding out now that it also can have autocatalytic function, mm -hmm. which means there are RNA sequences that can replicate themselves and and other and other structures. Uh, so RNA first, then proteins, and then those systems of molecules evolve slowly over millions of years in tandem until you get something resembling what we might call a cell, which again, just like we we're talking about earlier with speciation and, and this gradient of biological forms, we would have a gradient of systems of molecules, right? We have a, what would be called a physico-chemical continuum, whereby it would probably be quite difficult to go and look at these systems of molecules that are by chance in, in, enclosed in, in, in lipid, uh, lipid spheres and uh, in these vesicles and go, that one was the first cell. It's going to be hard to do that, but we know that we have systems of molecules, and then eventually we have systems of molecules that have some rudimentary form of metabolism and self-replication, right? And uh, so origin of life research is all about uh, elucidating those pathways by which that could have occurred through chemical synthesis and then systems chemistry. I think this is systems chemistry, again, as I've said in a lot of interviews, is um, 
the main field of science that those who 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 preach against uh, abiogenesis don't seem to understand uh, that just like it was never a monkey gave birth to a human, it was also never some molecules went like this and we've got a cell. That's not all. That also is not what happened. So anytime people are complaining about if or if or if 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 abiogenesis is possible, why can't we build a cell in a lab? Because that's not what nature did. Also, we can't just take some molecules and stitch them together like a quilt. And that's what life is. It's these systems of molecules that evolved very slowly over time until the until the complexification was such that it would be something that we would call a living system due to the properties of self-replication and metabolism. These things. Yeah, I've, I've seen a, a number of or I'm, I'm aware of uh, the importance of like you know, the Miller-Urey experiments, mm-hmm. multiple plural uh, but I think it's actually a bigger deal, the more recent research from like Sutherland's team that, that, that when they discovered that, hey, RNA can not only construct itself, but there are chemical situations with, that will construct RNA to begin with. So if there's no RNA to, begin, to build another RNA, there's, there's yep. a source for it to come from. That's actually a bigger deal, I think. Yeah. And, and what Gerald Joyce has done as well with these RNA systems to prove that there is evolution like behavior on the molecular level. So anybody who says, you know, James Tor says there's no selection on the molecular level, you are wrong. It has been demonstrated in a laboratory that there is selection on the molecular level. And uh, if anyone is interested, I have that content on, on, on his talking points and I show the papers of Gerald Joyce and I highlight the passages that demonstrate that conclusively selection is occurring on the molecular level. It happens. We've, we've shown it, we've seen it. That's the case. So I, I enjoy and, your videos on that, by the way, thank you're, you. very, you're, you're very thorough and, and brilliant. <laughs> I had to be the, the more someone mocks me, the more thorough I am in my rebuttal. So <laughs> and he mocked me quite a bit. So he got Do the wrath. You- do you guys agree with Dawkins that if life existed anywhere else in the, in the, in the universe, uh, they will still have to follow the Darwinian path of evolution? Well, I mean, it, it is, is it still going to be a situation where the same physics apply, where mathematics is still the same? Right. So, yeah, I, I would say so. If it's in our ga- – well, it's not our galaxy, probably going to have to go – yeah, true. That's a, that's a good point, actually. Yeah. In our galaxy. could be in our, in our solar system. We yeah. just haven't found it. It could be haven't on your – yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it can be very different than, than what we're expecting. I mean, whenever people try to imagine an alien being, it's funny how they every alien being is based on something that already exists in this planet. Right. And most of the people that came up with these aliens, like for the 1950s movie monsters, for example, had no concept of how alien de- deep sea yeah. marine organisms were. And to yep. look how bizarre that is. So we can have some very different things. But as Je- Jeremy England pointed out, among others, uh, you know, when we have the same chemicals, there's no upsidasium, there's no unobtainium, there's, you mm-hmm. know, we have the same periodic table applies <laughs> everywhere, and with the same laws apply everywhere, so ultimately the same, yeah. that, that Benoit Bendel brought thing, where the universe does this on its own, it doesn't just happen to happen here. Yeah, it's a fun game to play because, you know, for example, I mean, I, I think all, all the physical principles obviously would be the same because physics is everywhere. But I would go so far as to say that I have a very hard time comprehending how it would not also be carbon based. You know what I mean? Um, then then you get more and more specific. And I think that the, uh, obviously there are ways in which it could differ. Maybe it would be uh, maybe ammonia solvent instead of water solvent. I don't know. Like it, it depends on what's there. What, what is on this world, where it is evolving, what is abundant. But the, the most abundant chemical elements are these, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. These are the ones that are the most abundant uh, anywhere. So it would be very odd if it was not made of those, made of those elements. But morphologically, thinking, it could be way different, of course. Yeah. I was thinking if, if panspermia were, were true, uh, we will be the extraterrestrial, literally. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, although we don't really need it, we've got uh, you know plenty to work with here. <laughs> but yes, yeah, yeah. Um, right. Uh, I think that that's the last point we make, and then we can move to, into questions straight away. Um, do you think there will be a point uh, in our future where uh, evolution is taught respectfully in schools, and the ideas of religion will still be there, but people will not? take religion as as literal uh, these stories will be kind of there to inspire there are nice little stories for philosophy uh to for people to, to think about and and draw some ethical conclusions uh, and then science will be completely a separate uh, discipline where we 
probe reality and confirm it and, and things like that. Do you think there will be ever uh, a time when we can achieve that? Dave, you want to take that first? That's how it is in my happy little bubble of California already. So, yes, I hope that the whole world will one day be so progressive. Yeah. Yeah. So since you've asked a yes or no question, um, what is the alternative? We've seen that uh, we've seen this kind of trend to science denial, which is ultimately what this is. You know, the flat earth movement and the young earth thing, you know, denying all the evidence of the ancient earth and, and all of the different forms of reality denial. And to make up some, you know, fantasy alternative, we see all these evangelical preachers talk about how they're talking to God, how God showed up in their house one day and, and gave them some command that they have to follow. And this is, this is the make-believe thing. So we're either going to we're either going to straighten up, sober up, and figure out how to accept reality, and, and maybe we'll still have religion, but religion will have to evolve to become more sensible, realistic, or we can just reject science altogether and go back to our happy, clappy little fantasy land and go extinct immediately thereafter. Yeah. Yeah, whether right. it's climate or holy wars, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, This is an interesting first question because it's got a bit of biology and a bit of uh, theology. Uh, Aaron Rod, a question for you, Aaron, and, but also Dave, you can answer if you would like to. What are your thoughts on William Lane Craig, who accepts evolution but believes that Homo heidelbergensis were the first human <laughs> that possessed the soul? <laughs> well, in, in, in point of fact, he doesn't accept evolution. He's the one that said that if, if science contradicts the Bible, then science is wrong, yeah. that, that the Bible has to be right. Now, he has a problem with maybe not being biblical literalist because the, the Bible says a whole lot of stupid shit about the, the state of the earth in relation to the rest of the cosmos, all of which is demonstrably wrong. So there, yet there has to be a point where you have to realize, that, hey, there's no firmament, for example, you know, there is no giant crystal dome over the earth and the sun and the moon are not within the, and, and the sun and the moon are not, or the sun is not smaller than the earth. That's not the same size as the moon. The moon is not bigger than the stars. The sun is a star. Hey, the Bible didn't mention that, but he's not thinking about these things. He wants the Bible to have authority and he's making excuses for what he will say he can accept so that he won't have to argue those points. He just says that he accepts that. But then he comes up with this bullshit about Homo heidelbergensis being the first one to have a soul. So what, we had people up to that point for you know a number of different species, what we calling species, whether, that, whether that's literally true or not doesn't matter. Denisovans didn't have a soul. Neanderthals didn't have a soul. Uh, well, the Andersals were derived from Heidelbergensis, so we have Homo erectus, don't have a soul. Why not? Mm -hmm. And what the hell is a soul? And if, if, if people have souls, why don't dogs have souls? I think dogs have more soul than we do. But then yeah. if anything has a soul, then doesn't everything have a soul? I mean, doesn't every cell have a soul? Don't we have a collective life force in all things? Or am I getting too Star Trek? I mean, it's, it's easy to say a bacterium does not have a soul and a human has a soul. But then my question is, if I'm taking him at face value, um, what what behavior is it that you think you're explaining with the with with the construct of a soul? What is it that you think requires a soul in these particular species, but not others? Because other primate species and, and other mammalian species exhibit complex emotion and, and politically motivated behavior and all of these un incredibly complex behaviors that that these people seem to think we need souls to be able to achieve. So what is it, please, Mr. Craig, tell me, what is it you think that we have and do that requires a soul that, that differentiates us from other animals? I would yeah, like to, we know, you know, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought I'm, done, you were done. I'm sorry. Uh, and then we know, of course, know. that there's no, there's no support for mind body dualism, either in science nor in, in philosophy. Mm -hmm. So there's that problem as well. But if you did have a soul or if anything had a soul, then what if you clone a human? Let's say you clone a human, you get 10 different humans. Do each one of them get one tenth of a soul? Or if they don't, if they, if, does only the first one have a soul and the other ones just live soulless because you can have people who are soulless or if, if they all have a soul, then where did the nine extra souls come from? Mm -hmm. And what do they do? 
And when when is the soul arrived? Is is the soul present in a single celled zygote? And then what happens to uh, to to embryos that do not get carried to term? And what happens to fertilized uh, eggs or zygotes that do not uh, that don't um, attach to the uterine lining and just get you know get pissed out of the toilet? What happened to all of those? They didn't hear about Jesus. Or do we have a bunch of zygotes floating around in hell? Do we have a, a bunch of little blastulas of like you know fifteen cells? that are floating around in the lake of fire, like, because they didn't. I, I find this is quite intriguing because it's a, in a way, it's kind of an, a, an acknowledgement that Adam was German. Mm. <laughs> was the German? Yeah. Sorry, say that again. Uh, Adam was German because, well, oh. Heidelbergensis, you know, like that. It, it, well, you, you would expect Adam to have the, to, to be the okay. first man with a soul. And, and then therefore Adam makes Adam the first, um, German, right. For whatever Smith. reason, the, the idea that that someone like Craig would assume that the first human with a soul was German just kind of makes sense. <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, this is funny. Um, there's another one here from Manning the Fort. Thank you for the super chats. Uh, Varen's Ross Parrot reproduces and we get a cat. Lamarckian evolution is confirmed. Um, uh, on, only if this was acquired, while well, it's uh, if it was genetically um, um, adapted or genetically in inherited, that what wouldn't be Lamarckian. Lamarckian, my understanding, it, it has to be the the passing through of acquired um, traits in one's life. Yep. So if mm -hmm. if I if I lose my foot in Vietnam, yeah. uh, then my children will be born without that foot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But but even evolution had its own evolution. It's really funny. So you know these people are still saying evolution is a thing, but the, they couldn't get the the right mechanism. So these maybe were the first steps at evolution. But they're they were saying, well, we we weren't just all found that way. We there there is certain um, evolution in our um, advancement as species. Um, is one here. Uh, Aaron said, if there is a God, evolution will still be mostly true. My question is, why mostly, not completely? I say mostly. Um, you, I, I can't remember, but if you said it, you probably would retract that now, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have said mostly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, any God that exists must be one that is compatible okay. with the body of scientific knowledge we have uncovered empirically. So, completely and totally. <laughs> Well, uh, I don't see any more questions, and I and I think I've t I've taken enough of your time, and uh, and I'm I'm really I've really enjoyed this so much, uh, um, and uh, I'd like to to thank you both, and let's see we're taking sort of final comments, we're starting with with Aaron. Okay, um, I don't have anything final to say, <laughs> so let's just move on. Yeah, I mean, no, not not so much either. Except that this year, I I, I think this is going to be a focus for me in terms of my debunks. Uh, you know, the DI folks and some other targets. But uh, yeah, I, I really want to focus on some of these specious arguments and uh, especially some of the more sophisticated ones, and um, just put them to bed so we can move on as a species. You know, actually, I'll I'll give a good one for Aaron to to, to end with. Um, he has taken. Uh, or undertaken the the mammoth project of covering the Quran, which was <laughs> quite quite a a journey. We kind of we were part of it at some point, and uh, uh, it's coming to an end. Aaron, uh, you maybe would tell the, the folks about it. <laughs> What's coming to an end? The Quran, the Quran series. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I finished the. I, I wrote my last blog post. We're going to probably do. Uh, it normally would probably be done in two parts for the length of it. It is a little bit. Um, it is a little a little sad that we produced a team of people that I quite enjoy meeting with every two weeks for for forty months now. We've been wow. meeting with uh, ex-Muslim apostates who speak Arabic, who were raised in Islam, and who understand all of the interpretations and such that I, as a Westerner, would never be able to figure out on my own. I know that if I if I were raised in Pakistan and I'd never met a Christian, if I read the Bible, I would never get that Jesus was supposed to be his own father or that the serpent was supposed to be Satan because, or that, or that there's the, the Dante's Inferno lake of fire kind of thing. Cause those things 
are not in the Bible. It's, I mean, it's not the, the kind of damnation that, that Christians believe in now is not detailed therein. So there's a lot of interpretations that people use that I wouldn't know. And I figured it does, must be the same thing happening if I were to read the Quran. And in fact, it is. So there's a lot of things about the Quran that you just have to be grow, you have to grow up in Islam to know the background story, to know what it's talking about. So that was the advantage of having all these people explain this to me. And that, you know, some point and a month from now or so, of those uh, sessions will be over with, and I'll, I'll be sad to see that end. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, folks, for today's uh, chat, and I um, look forward to seeing you again in the future. Good luck with your endeavors. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.